Good morning. They said they're letting all the animals out of the cages now. <laughs> I appreciate y'all coming. <laughs> We're praying we have no human sacrifices today. I hope you had, uh, had a great time the last few days, especially with your family if you had the opportunity. But I'm just glad to be with you, and we're praising God for his goodness to us. My head is moving very rapidly about things that we need to do for our country, for the peril we now face. And when it's all said and done, all of it's said and done, there's nothing better we can do than what we're talking about, preaching the Word of God. Because preaching accomplishes what nothing else does. It truly does accomplish amazing things. And we're grateful to God for that. I want us to pray together and then we'll begin. I hope you have pen in hand and you're ready to go. Good. And so, very good. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank Thee for this day and for Thy love and mercy. We thank Thee, Lord God, for the power of Your Word when preached in the power of the Holy Spirit. Guide us by Your Spirit. Help us this day to please Thee in all things. In Christ Jesus' name we ask. Amen. We're dealing with the subject of preaching, and you know, it's a little bit strange for one of us preachers to think that he can say to other preachers, this is how it ought to be done. So I want to clear that up. The fact of the matter is, I'm just trying to find from the Bible what we find going on in the life and ministry of the New Testament preacher in the first century. And I think if that's what we could aim for, that's the thing God blessed and used in the first century church, and I believe that's the thing God will bless and use in our churches this day. I have a wonderful list of questions that you've sent in. Some of you do really well at this. <laughs> I appreciate it too. And I'm, I'm sort of tempted to get into the questions first, but I think if I don't say a few things, I'll never get to them. And we were trying to finish up today with some certain things about preaching. And I, I want to help you. I've been helped greatly. Everything reproduces after its own kind. And so what happens, you find preaching helping preaching. And you're inspired and instructed to preach by preaching. Other people preaching. And the people are always going to ask me who are the preachers that affected me greatly. And um, sometimes... It's not what they did, it's what they said. It's sort of like uh, coaches in, in high levels of sporting events. Sometimes you find the coach who says the greatest things, if his instruction is followed, it'll improve the person playing and also improve the team. But he could not be a great player. And there is such a thing as someone who could say some wonderful things about preaching that would help all of us but they may not, in your mind or my mind or in my estimation or your estimation, be the greatest of preachers. Uh, Campbell Morgan, I reminded you uh, that he said and wrote that preaching ought to be scriptural, always biblical, and we ought to know the Bible so well that we speak Bible language in these things. And also it ought to be simple, that means not, as you might imagine, simple as we always define the word now, but in simplicity, in simplicity, a straightforwardness, a single-mindedness. And uh, always when the preacher's finished, we ought to be able to say, this is what he said. If you can't say, this is what he said, <laughs> you're in pretty bad shape. As a matter of fact, I think a sermon ought to be summed up in a, a, a declarative kind of statement so that you can say, 
this is what I'm going to say and then say it. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to say in speaking, this is what I'm going to say, but to oneself as you're studying, what is the, the worth of this message? Why am I giving this? Why is this emphasis being placed where it is? And that's, for me, something that's always been a great help to me because for me, the gospel appeal or the gospel invitation, and when I say gospel, I mean gospel, the appeal of the message is not always a gospel sermon, but it ought to have the gospel in it. And there's many people who have not mastered, but have, have really worked hard at getting the gospel in it, putting that hook in the message with the gospel. Because for me, maybe we should talk sometimes about the appeal or the invitation because the sermon is not complete without the appeal or the invitation. And that ought to have some thought given to it because you've been speaking all this time and you're trying to convince people or ask people or appeal to people that this is what we ought to be doing. What is it we ought to be doing? I hear lots of preachers speak and they, they ramble. They, they're not sharp. I don't mean being sharp mentally. I mean when you listen to them speak, you still have to wonder, what do, they want, what do they want me to do? What is this sermon all about? What appeal is being made here? So that's very, very important. So with, with singleness, sim, singleness and simplicity, simplicity, and then sincerity toward God. It ought by all means be a Bible sermon. Some people preach expository sermons and they think that's the only Bible sermons they are. But there are many men who preach great messages. From time to time I hear them and they're not expository messages. I like the expository preaching, but I don't condemn all preaching that's not expository. You may. But uh, my, my method in preaching is very simple. My method is using the context of the passage for the introduction so that we know why we're here and what we're doing and then uh, coming straight forward with some, something in the context of that, that passage that this is trying to find why did God include this in the Bible? What, what is the emphasis the Lord is making? And to make that emphasis our emphasis, to, to appeal the way the Lord appeals to us by His Spirit. Now, there are many things that God did not tell us in the Bible, but He's told us so many things that we are obviously aware of from Scripture. Why did He tell us those things? And uh, I don't speculate often in, in preaching and just imagine things or uh, put up some sort of conjecture about if this and that and the other. I just try to preach the Bible in simplicity and godly sincerity. Well, we'll talk more about the, but our list of things we were giving, I hope you have written down when we find the New Testament preacher and the first century preacher. We found certain things about his preaching and you wrote them down. And uh, I, I hope that you got the message that God is building the messenger. I, I enjoyed telling you the things that, Mr. Spurgeon said about preaching, I gave you a list of eight things. You might want to get that sometime because it'll help you just to refresh yourself and think about it. But the, the first century preacher, if you walked into a church and listened to him, he may have sounded loud or not loud or whatever, but he was persuasive and um, he warned in preaching. One of the assignments God clearly gives the preacher is to warn. And then we find from Acts chapter 24 and verse 25 that the first century preacher reasoned in his preaching. I want you to think about to whom you're preaching. And we reason in our preaching. We're appealing to people. All men, women, people listening have a conscience. You, you want them to move with what they know God is convincing them they ought to do. And the preacher, in a sense, is confirming these things are true. This is God's message, and we ought to be agreeing with God's message. Write down Acts chapter 24 and verse 25, Paul's preaching 
to Felix, the Roman governor. And the Bible says of Paul's preaching, and as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Now, I read years ago a sermon by L.R. Scarborough on this, on the, the reasoning in the preaching of the Apostle Paul. And it really moved my heart. And Scarborough was a great preacher, no doubt. Many people emulated Scarborough's messages and preached like he preached. He was president of Southwestern Seminary at one time and a mighty evangelistic preacher. Friends with C.E. Matthews and others of that era. But he said when he got into this text, Paul is reasoning here. And he reasoned. What it is to reason? You know, God said to us in, in, in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, he said, come now, let us reason together. Let us reason together. In other words, I'm giving you, I'm giving you this idea that I believe because of the way I made you, you can come to conclusions. And let's reason together. Find this to be true. And so uh, I, I think that's the, the force we're getting in this text. And the preacher's doing that. You're not just talking at people like a machine gun. You're speaking with people. And they're thinking. And when they're thinking, they're coming to conclusions. And you're not trying to overpower them and make them come to conclusions. What you're trying to do is trying to get them to think with you what you're saying and to get them to come to the conclusion that the Holy Spirit is guiding them to. And so this is what we're trying to do. And so he reasoned. He reasoned of three things. Righteousness. And think what you would say. Temperance. And judgment to come. And judgment to come. There's an inevitable meeting with God. And the Bible says that Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. He trembled. He was obviously affected by Paul's preaching. But then he trembled and he did what so many people do. He's put it off. Go this way for this time. Go thy way for this time. When I have a more convenient season, I will call for thee. And that's the devil's number one trick. But he reasoned. May the Holy Spirit help me not to be distracted right now. And, uh, and as I'm looking at some of you, I get distracted. And uh, you must know that we have pictures of you. And so I, I appreciate being able to see you. But keep in mind, we're watching you as you're watching us. And some of you don't want to come on a picture, and that's fine. I'm always trying to challenge these people who help me not to stay focused on one person while he's cleaning his nose out and that type of thing and all of that. But the whole matter is I'm trying to preach too. And as he reasoned, uh, I want to give a little caution here. The caution is that preachers think because they're speaking as an authoritative person, they can overpower a person and push them beyond their will. And I don't think that's what the Bible is teaching us here. And may God help us. You need to trust the Lord. Salvation is talked about with cute cliches sometimes. And the New Testament preacher is a man who takes the word of God and reasons with people. He shows them the scripture. He deals logically with the truth of God's word. He presses the matter. He deals with the subject of sin. He's reasoned. As Paul reasoned here of righteousness. We must be clothed in his righteousness of temperance. Temperance is a matter of control and the only way to have real control is be under God's control and judgment to come. Sometimes people with some authority think that they never have to give an answer for anything. There's no consequences to their sin. But the New Testament person preaches and reasons as he preaches. What you're doing, you're reminding people that there's a reckoning day coming, a reasoning. And so 
May God help us. He says in chapter 28, verse 23, And when they had appointed him a day, uh, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. So how is he preaching? How is he preaching? Uh, I, I'm not trying to be cruel to anyone, but I, I'm, I'm trying to say as a pastor, and I love pastoral preaching, um, don't just throw information at people and throw information at people. A pastor warned me one time years ago. He said, you're not giving people time to think even between phrases. You don't have to stop thinking and pause long, but sometimes you give some statement and you need to give the people long enough to say yes or no or maybe or that's right or I agree with that. So you're reasoning when you're preaching. And the aim is to get people to God's side, not your side, but to God's side. That's very important to me that you're, you're not trying to say, look, I'm right, you're wrong. I know what's right and you don't. don't. Don't get that attitude in the pulpit. You're trying to take the word of God and say to people, now this is God's way. This is what God has said. It's inevitable these things are going to happen because God has told us they're going to happen. And I think you give authority to preaching when you're speaking from God's vantage point, from the Lord's. You're not God. You're not perfect. What you say is not perfect. But you're reasoning with people. As God said, as I said earlier, come now, let us reason together. And so, and the first century preacher, another thing, preached in the power of the Holy Spirit. Dr. Lee Robertson is a man I worked for for a long time and, of course, remained close friends with him until his death. This was one of the central thoughts of his whole being, that we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, I've written a little booklet about it. I encourage you to get it. Um, I don't think anybody is an authority on that subject. But the fact of the matter is we do know some things. And I was listening to a man years ago. He really wasn't much of an effective preacher, but he said something I've never forgotten. That's pretty effective, isn't it? He said to me, um, being filled with the Holy Spirit is not as much involved in content as it is in control. And he illustrated with a man's hands on a steering wheel. And he said, uh, who's in control? And that control comes from yielding and yielding and yielding. And I found that to be true in my own life that what I'm trying to do is yield to the Lord, to yield to God, to yield to Him and yield again and yield again. And the Lord reminds me of things in my life that are not under His yielding, not under His control. And uh, content, we're all, in, we're all indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Dr. W.A. Criswell, I need to reprint Dr. Criswell's book on the uh, Holy Spirit in today's world. If you can get an old copy of it, get it. It's a paperback, The Holy Spirit in Today's World. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. But the fact of the matter is, um, it's not a matter of content. The Lord already lives in you. It's a matter of whether or not you're yielding to Him. Is your life in His hands? Are you preaching for Him or for yourself? Are you more concerned about what people think about you and say about you when you finish preaching? Or are you more concerned about what people think and say about God when you're finished preaching? Um, and you know, make him big. As John the Baptist said, and I repeat, he must increase, he must increase, he must increase, I must decrease. So the filling of the Holy Spirit is an essential thing. And uh, we can talk about being filled maybe a little later. The first century preacher was mighty in scriptures. He knows the Bible. You know, it amazes me always to think that the Bible only has one author. So he doesn't contradict himself. You, you just need to read, compare, search, 
memorize, meditate upon the Word of God, and let God teach you His Word and make reference. I think, of course, as you do too, that the greatest commentary on the Bible is the Bible. So I always, I'm always doing this. And it may not be helpful to some people, but it's helpful to me. Uh, I'm always taking a passage and comparing it with another passage, reinforcing the statement I make from one testament with a statement from another testament. Now, I'm a dispensationalist, but I'm not so heavy a dispensationalist that I've chopped the Bible up in pieces. I believe there is a difference between the church and Israel, and basically that makes me a dispensationalist. But there are some people who won't even spend time in parts of the Bible. But all of God's Word is given by inspiration of God, and all of God's Word is profitable for us. All of it's profitable. So uh, I think it's very good to take a passage and, and then reinforce that passage with another passage. And something else, when I was a young preacher starting out, I memorized everything and... and uh, I wouldn't even read from the Bible. I'd memorize the passage I was going to preach on and, and say it. And people got pretty impressed with me that I knew all that scripture. And then I realized, who's getting the glory here? It certainly wasn't the Lord. I was more concerned about getting it all right myself than I was about people following the Lord and finding the Lord. So then I, 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 what I know about preaching, I learned in Patterson, New Jersey. You can stay right there for a moment. In Patterson, New Jersey, those people held me to account. Now you think about it. They, they didn't let me have a pass. They wanted to know, is that in the Word of God? Is that in the Bible? Show me. Show me where it is in the Bible. I actually had people who would stand up early on there and say, where is that in the Bible? And so I developed a whole different style of preaching. Take your Bible and turn with me. And then we would go to a passage. And as we went to a passage, I would say to them, as we went to a passage, I would say, I'm going to, I'm going to tell them what they're going to find. Have you ever been on a tour and the tour guide is with you? And the tour guide, while you're on the bus and haven't arrived at the site yet, will say to you, my wife and I have been to Israel, for example, 16 different times. And the tour guide is telling us what we're going to see. And then he's telling us not only what we're going to see, but when we get there, what we're seeing. And then after, after we, we're there, he tells us what we've seen, what we're going to see, what we see, and what we've seen. Well, I think you're preaching, you're guiding people through the God's Word. You're, 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 you're guiding people through the Bible and through God's Word. And as you guide people through God's Word, you're, you're telling them what we're going to see. You might say to somebody, turn with me to Luke chapter 9, verse 10, and, and you wait till they all find it. Well, I, I, I have my Bible marked so I can find the passage I'm going to. And I mark it a certain way. I'm always marking it in a certain way. I use little clips like this, and there's a smooth side and a rough side, and I make sure I pin my Bible with the right side so when I take it out, it doesn't tear the page and then I'm always finding scripture in the direction of where I've started so when I open it I've opened it in the direction I'm going in other words if I'm in the book of Acts and I'm going to read a, a passage from Luke chapter 16 I'll put the clip so that when I turn I'm at, at that passage and uh, from Acts to Luke 16. I don't know if that's clear to you or not, but anyway, I've marked my Bible. And I tell people what we're going to read instead of just sitting there and saying, all you ignorant sinners found the scripture yet? All you people who don't know where anything is in the Bible, have you found it yet? Or to make some derogatory remark toward an audience to say, I know some of you are slow, but I, I would never do that. These, these are people you want to be kind to. They're they're listening to you. They're sitting there. They came to hear. Thank them for that. And be polite to them. There's no excuse for an impolite pastor. Now, if you're preaching against hell and sin and 
you want to rip and tear and, snare and, 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 and tear into it, fine. But, and if you want to say, I say sometimes, sometimes I will say something like, that so many of you right here are liars to the core. And uh, I don't know, God may lead me to do that. But I don't want to be unkind to the people. Anyway, know the scriptures because it's the power of God's word that we're, we want to see. And it's the word of God that will not return void. Your cute little stories, they may forget them after they've told them to somebody or maybe never tell them again. But God's word will return. You can, you can count on it. it. It'll rise up again. The Holy Spirit will take it and speak, speak, speak to people's minds. Maybe at the most inopportune time, but God's taking that opportunity and he'll bring that to mind. So handle the Bible with, with a certain care. Handle the Bible. It's quick and powerful and sharp than any two-edged sword, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says. And the Bible says the preachers in the first century were mighty in the Scriptures. Mighty in the Scriptures. And it's so powerful. Uh, oh, so many things I'd like to say here because if we're not Bible preachers, we're not where God wants us to be. And... Uh, I've told you my little story about Brother Hagen. God bless him. He had lots of wonderful books in his library like you do. And I was just a young preacher starting out and I was you know, wanting to get all of them I could get. And I said to him, you got any sermon books? And he said, all my sermon books are over here in a certain place. And I remember that very day in, in, in the church there when I was in his study down in the basement of the church. And we were talking about all that. And uh, he said, take what you want to. Use them all. They're yours to use. And so what happened then, I loaded up my arm with them. And I started out the door. And he said, now, Clarence, I want to tell you something. If you'll learn how to preach the Bible, you will never run out of anything to preach. Now, I preached uh, Herschel Ford's simple sermons. I preached... Uh, Lots of people's sermons, like other preachers have done. I made them my own uh, by reading them and studying them and repeating them. But today, most of it's just building a sermon. And it's been that way for years and years, building a sermon. But it's the Bible. It is the Bible that we want to preach. The first century preacher uh, was instructed in the way of the Lord. What is the way of the Lord? In Acts chapter 18, verse 25, this man was instructed in the way of the Lord. Uh, that's what the Bible says of Apollos. This means he submitted himself to be instructed. He was instructed, meaning his instruction had to do with knowing things and being able to get hold of those things with the eventual purpose of giving those things to other people. Are you able to tell people and help people and show people the way of the Lord, the way of the Lord, and what you're convincing people of? Now, we all, all, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's the issue. We've gone our own way. Even all this highly taunted psychological preaching that we get today. Oh, may God help us and deliver us. And mostly it is about how wonderful men are. But we have a way, God has a way. And the preacher knowing the way of the Lord and getting people to see their way leads to death but His way leads to life eternal. Do you know the way of the Lord? And so we must be people who know the way of the Lord. May God help us. The first century preacher also was fervent in spirit. Now what does that mean? The Bible says in Acts chapter 18, verse 25, and being fervent in spirit, I prayed with men who were fervent in prayer. Have you ever prayed with somebody who was fervent in prayer? Uh, sometimes you hear men who've been criticized. I'd be careful now. Some of these men that people have criticized so 
tremendously criticized them. They've never heard them pray. I remember praying with Ian Paisley in his own church. And Dr. Paisley asked me, he had heard one of my sermons on an old CD, asked me to come to Martyrs Memorial Church and preach a revival meeting. I did. Some people criticized it. They're still criticizing it. But if he were still alive and he asked me to come, I'd go preach. And if I could get him to come preach here, I'd get him to come preach here. Uh, he was not a baby baptizer, as some people said. And he was a man preaching the gospel to people with a fervent spirit for souls. But it's not my position to try to defend somebody like that. I'm just telling you, I prayed with the man in a private place. Nobody didn't press. And I knew he was fervent in prayer. And he was fervent in preaching, but he was fervent in spirit. I prayed with Peter Masters. Uh, the first time I, I prayed with Peter Masters, and I prayed with him before, he would not even want me to say this. He wants no, no bragging or promoting of himself. But I noticed he covered his eyes when he prayed with his hand. He covered his eyes. And I thought, well, you can close your eyes. I'm thinking to myself, he could close his eyes. But he covered his eyes and tried to shut out everything or any thought of anything except God. And he started praying about the greatness of God. Not some elaborate, phony type thing, but I know, I know this. When we finished praying, he finished praying, I believed he was fervent in, in spirit and fervent in his prayer life. And it really spoke to my heart. I, I'd love to meet more people like that who are fervent in spirit. The Bible says Apollos was fervent in spirit. W.A. Crispus said Apollos was the greatest preacher in the New Testament. Now, he's in, he's in heaven now, Apollos and Dr. Criswell. But if you want to uh, take it up with somebody, don't take it up with me. I'm just telling you what the man said. And he wrote about it too. Fervent, fervent in spirit. Mm. Well, the first century preacher was diligent. The Bible in describing Apollos continues to say, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. What is a diligent person? Diligent person. Uh, W.B. Riley was a famous pastor in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And he gave the illustration about diligence. Dr. Robertson shared this with me because Riley was one of his favorite preachers. Uh, Riley described diligence as a, an act of a little shoeshine boy in, in olden days, not so long ago, but when there were places you could get your shoes shined. And he had a young man who was shining his shoes. He was traveling somewhere and he got up on the stand and had, had his shoes shined. And he, uh, he said he never lifted up his head. Never lifted his head. There may have, been, may have been some cultural motivation about that. I don't think so, but he had a job to do. He had shoes to look at. He had shoes to shine. He had a work to finish. And he was diligent till he got it done. Uh, the most diligent preacher I ever heard was Hyman Appleman. And I heard him many times. I hosted him. And had him in the car with me. I saw him get mad at a, a singer one time. I mean, really angry at a singer. That is, uh, at, at, a, at a singer, and the singer was a friend of mine. But he talked about all the playful things he was doing and all that. And uh, Appleman just burst out like that. He just burst out and said, I, "I don't do. I don't do those things. I'm going to India next next week to preach the word of God." And he just he just sort of flamed on the fella. And I thought I almost felt sorry for the singer, but he got his point across. And um, I never saw a man preach with such diligence and intensity. He was talking about beheading a Saul one time and took his watch off. And he had done this before, no doubt, because he learned how to move it against the mic and make a, a filing noise like they were sharpening the axe. Lord have mercy, I got up out of my seat and leaned forward. I thought, somebody sharpened me an axe there. And he was talking about it at the same time. And when he got the axe sharp, he, he talked about it being brought up to be used. And, and then there was a, a dull thud. I thought, surely I've just witnessed the beheading of the Apostle Paul. 
I really was in it. And I thought, I've never forgotten that. That's been years and years and years. That's been 30 years ago or more, 40 years ago. <laughs> been 100 years ago. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Some preachers exaggerate too, don't they? But anyway, it, it was, he was diligently into it. And you know, you don't have to yell and scream to be diligent in preaching. There's just, there's an intensity here. Uh, just an intensity. God help us. Have you ever heard the sermon? Write this down, please. Have you ever heard the sermon by R.G. Lee, The Prayer of Concern? The Prayer of Concern. Write it down, would you please? The Prayer of Concern. I guarantee you it'll help you. The Prayer of Concern. It's a sermon he preached at the pastor's conference that was meeting in the First Baptist Church in Dallas. And uh, it was during a Southern Baptist Convention pre preamble type meeting. I understand. I wasn't there. But someone sent it to me. I think, I think, uh, I think Tom Messer sent it to me years ago. I'm not positive about that. But I've sent it to a lot of people. We put it on our websites. Ryan, don't we have that on our what website? The Prayer of Concern. Church. On our church, templebaptistchurch.com. Yeah. And uh, the prayer of concern. Oh, I never heard such a sermon on prayer. I never heard such a sermon on prayer. And it wasn't, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like payday someday, Dr. Lee's message. I tried to preach that one time. Lord help us all. And... Uh, uh, it was such a message. But I'm just saying, a preacher ought to be diligent. People say, now that's a preacher. He's a preacher. He delivered his soul. The Bible says of Apollos again, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to know that there were men who were pastors who were teaching diligently the things of the Lord. Then the preacher in the Bible in the first century was bold. I think there's always a lot of confusion about boldness. Boldness can be abusive. I'm not talking about this kind of boldness where somebody calls women heifers and you know uses crude statements. I'm not for that. I, I don't believe your language ought to be bad or off color. I don't believe they ought to be rude to anybody. Rudeness is not boldness. And by the way, boldness without humility is abusive. But the Bible continues, knowing only the baptism of John, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Apollos hit a little bump in the road, and a sweet thing happened to him. <laughs> Aquila and Priscilla. But anyway... He was teaching and preaching everything he knew. He began to speak boldly. And so the Apostle Paul had spent about a, a year and a half with Aquila and Priscilla. No doubt he taught them. And when they heard Apollos preaching boldly, but only knowing the baptism of John, the Bible says in Acts 18, 26, when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him, unto them. I love that expression. And expounded to him the way of God more perfectly. Some people I know today would have said, that idiot preaching over there doesn't know what he's talking about. But they took him unto them. They took him unto them. And by the way, he, he became an even greater preacher because of their contribution to his life. It's amazing what you learn from the Bible, isn't it? They took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. When he was come, help them much which had believed through grace. What a beautiful, beautiful statement. 
The New Testament preacher also convinced mightily concerning Christ. He mightily convinced the Jews, mightily convinced the Jews. Matthew 18, 28. Don't pass over this quickly. Think about this. Is your, is your preaching convincing concerning Christ? If I ask you right now, let's just stop right now and I say, who is Jesus Christ? What is your statement? Who is he? So he's the virgin born son of God. He's co-equal, co-existent, eternally existent with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Hmm. He became a man. God became a man without ceasing to be God. Go ahead. Tell me, tell me, convince me about who Christ is. By his deeds, by his work, by his words. The New Testament preacher was convincing mightily that Jesus, born the Nazarene, born in Bethlehem of a virgin, lived a sinless life, proved by his power, by his doctrine, that he's Christ. Who is Christ? Christ, the Messiah, the Old Testament promise of the Redeemer. Who is he? These preachers were making a beeline at who Jesus Christ is. In other words, brother, after you listened to him, you came out of there and you had, to, you had to say, yes, he is God, or no, he's not God. And you know, sometimes people get, get through hearing us and they say, well, what a wonderful this or that. Maybe they don't even say that. Maybe never. It's like the, it's like the story we've all heard it and probably all told it about the American group that went to London to hear the preachers in London and they, they went uh, on the morning and heard Joseph Parker at the uh, temple. And they came out and they said, what a preacher. And he was. Um, but they went that evening to hear Spurgeon. And they came out of Spurgeon's meeting and they said to one another, what a savior. What a savior. <laughs> I'd want him to say, what a Savior, wouldn't you? Sometimes I have to give myself a test. Would you take it? I give myself an examination. How much of Christ was in this sermon? How much of Jesus was in this message? How much did I say about him and who he is and what he could do? Well, you say, that just didn't go with my subject. <laughs> Well, brother, you better improve on that subject because there's no greater subject matter than the Son of God. And so that's what was on the heart, convincing people concerning Christ. And they did it mightily, Acts 18, 28. And then that first century preacher also declared publicly that Jesus is Christ. Publicly. Hmm. Now, you cannot have a public ministry if your private life is not what it should be. You see, really, it ought to be where you just can't help but talk about the Lord. It's like B.R. Lakin said about preaching. It's like the measles. It'll break out on you sooner or later. But have you ever just broken into statements about the Lord in a cafeteria, a restaurant, or place to eat or a doctor's office and you're speaking publicly I like to think that every preacher who has a pulpit to mount preaching the word of God that every preacher who is a pastor every preacher who is an evangelist has moments in time where he just breaks out publicly about who Jesus is you know we could encourage one another in that couldn't we Oh, A.T. Pearson said, study the discourses of Jesus Christ and uh, you can get his discourses from the Bible, what he preached on and how he preached on it. And there's so many major discourses in his preaching. You can get them. I give you a list of them if you want them. They're in Pearson's book uh, in the scriptures, knowing the scriptures. Anything you read by A.T. Pearson 
in my opinion, is a good read, and I hope you can do that. Um, so many more things. I'll include all of this and more, I hope, uh, in the book I'm writing on preaching and teaching the Word of God. But let me answer some of your questions, or at least try. Every time I do this, I think what we should do is have some of you answering them. But how much time should I give each week in sermon preparation? First, let me say that I've been a preacher for 54 years plus, and all of that's involved in my preparation. Sometimes, to be very frank, sometimes uh, getting a sermon is so difficult, and sometimes it's so easy, and uh, a few minutes I've got a thought, and I just elaborate on that thought. That's very seldom ever happens, but preaching takes time. My pastor said to me, it's not, ins it's not inspiration, it's perspiration. So you must set aside times to study. There are times you study. There's a place you study. There's an area where you study, and you don't have distracting things there. Uh, Bob Norman, who was one of my uh, spiritual fathers years ago, and a great man, I look forward to seeing him, uh, Brother Horm Norman in heaven, Dr. Bob Norman. He was pastor of the Belmont Heights Baptist Church in Nashville, Tennessee, and took such an interest in me. I was so young, and I thought he was so old. And um, what a precious man. I'm honored that he let me be his friend. But he's the man who told me that where I'm studying, and he took me into his study, I clear off everything where I'm studying except the books I'm going to use on that particular subject and that passage and my Bible and that so I'm not distracted by something over here. I'm interested in a biographical book or something. I, I got everything. And he's the one who taught me to put things in my own personal library where I could reach without getting up and moving around the, the helpful things I use all the time. And, uh, you know, the word study books, the, and, and then I pulled everything. I've got a set of books in the front of my desk that are going on to go with the subject matter that I'm dealing with at that particular time. Spurgeon had a, a secretary, had two secretaries, male secretaries, and one of them uh, was a faithful lifetime friend who came to work with Spurgeon after the death of his, that's the secretary's, William Joseph Harrell, after the death. We've got to reprint that book, James, Surgeon's Armor Bearer, Spurgeon's Armor Bearer, and there's only one copy of it in captivity, and we need to get it. We may have to break into Spurgeon's College over there and get it, and then we can reprint it. I want to put one, one in one front of it, I'm going to put that book, it's not a very long book, and on the other side of it, I want to flip it where you can turn it around and start from the other side on the life of, of J.R. Faulkner because he was Dr. Robertson's armor bearer. We wouldn't be talking about Lee Robertson if it wasn't for J.R. Faulkner. And we wouldn't be talking about Charles Spurgeon if it wasn't for William Joseph Harrell. Uh, his deacon said that. He said he was the best friend Spurgeon ever had. Well, you see how you get distracted? Uh, God help us. But anyway, um, so... Sermon preparation. I write my sermons. You may not, uh, because I try to preach without notes, and but I try to remember what I've written, <laughs> and I don't say everything I've written. But I, I want to think about how I'm going to begin, what I'm going to say. I got so anxious about that years ago that I, I developed a style of preaching that is just um, thank you for being here. Let's take the word of God, please. Turn with me to a certain book of the Bible, I tell them, and open to this passage and then say when I read it, if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I don't want to tell people to mark the Bible and all they've got with them is a, ball, uh, is a great big magic marker, you know. <laughs> but if they carry the pen, that they can mark the Bible. Our people do that. And they mark this passage, and that's what I'm going to speak on. And then I give the context of the passage as an introduction it's the simplest thing in the world. I had a preacher. He has since killed himself, and I'm sorry about that. But he said to me one time, he said, I don't think it takes much of you to preach because you're, just, you're the simplest person I've ever heard in my life. He was, he was trying to be critical. He didn't like me. 
and I tried to, to love him. But anyway, he said, you just read the verse of the Bible and tell people what it says and what it means and then read another verse and tell them what it means. And read the... I said, yes, that's basically, that's basically what I do. And, uh, and I heard it, the last time I heard him preach, he told seven major stories in one sermon. Seven. I'm sorry I counted them, but I got so bored with it I counted them. And, uh, and I thought, he can't, he can't finish because he's trying to fill a time period with the stories that he's telling. Give me God's word. Give me God's word. So, sermon preparation, knowing the Bible, you know, know the great characters of the Bible, uh, know the summaries of the books of the Bible. They ought to be favorite books for you that you could tell people in summary what's in every chapter of those books of the Bible. Uh, whether it's the 50 chapters in Genesis or whatever. But, but, and then connect, connect in your sermon preparation. Connect things with things. Uh, who, was, who was Joshua, the son of the tribe of Ephraim? Who was Ephraim, the son of Joseph? And where was Joseph, the son of Jacob? And where did all that start? And how does it all connect? Connect everything. Find a place for all information that you're studying. You may not use it all in that one sermon. But um, I could talk about that sometime. But as you remind us, we, we keep ourselves stirred up. Can you recommend some good places to listen to Bible preaching online? Well, now that may be the thing that stirs you up. I, I don't listen to a lot of preaching online. Every once in a while, some of these fellows will tell me something that they listened to that really stirred them up, like that sermon on... Um, the prayer of concern. That's powerful. Dr. Richard Land just gave me the ten greatest sermons ever preached by, by um, Charles Spur I mean, by W. A. Criswell. And I would want Dr. Land to know this because I really love and respect Dr. Land, and I'm crazy about Criswell's preaching, but I can't get my recorder to work. By the way, you ordered it for me. It won't work. <laughs> We've got to get that thing fixed. But uh, if that's what stirs you up, somebody somebody reading somebody something will stir you up, whatever. Uh, uh, sermon audio, sermon audio is a place, if you want to hear preaching that will stir your heart, look, uh, Stephen Lee has done something for this entire generation in sermon audio. That will help you so much. Um, what tips do you have for teaching through a book of the Bible? Don't start with a large one. You know, you'll be preaching the rest of your life on it. Some people say, I'm going to tell you everything God said to me in the book of Isaiah. Oh, come off of it. Uh, preach through the book of Jude or something. <laughs> if you run out of something to say, I've written a whole book on that. Or... Uh, First John, I got a book on that. What, I'm, I'm about to print a book on uh, Second and Third John. So, but start and then learn how to summarize the whole Bible book. The book, what's it about? The hardest sermons are the first and the last one in a sermon series. And you'll want to tell everything you know in the first one, and and think of all you should have told in the last one. But uh, my goal is to preach on everything in the Bible before I'm gone. And I've got a 54-year start on some of you. And, and, and the people who keep records for me know every chapter I've preached on and everything in every book I've preached on. And I constantly ask them, find anything else I haven't preached on in the Bible because I want to make sure it all gets its washing done on my heart and then I can give it to the people. And I, that's one of the things I've loved with a long pastorate. And so... I'm trying to do that. Think that way. You may not stay anywhere for six months, but think you're going to stay the rest of your life and preach that way. Uh, my wife is very interested in a shepherd's summit with pastors, their wives, and with you and Mrs. Sexton. I am too. We want to do that. Why hasn't why somebody made me do that yet? You know, I'll do that. I'll do that right away, and I'll send out information about it so you can 
get her. What time of day would be best for wives to be able to listen? Something early, something late? Uh, why don't you send me an email or two? It might help. I'd love to do that. And my wife, I don't know why much she, oh, to get her started, she's like the man who started the steam engine, you know, on the ship. And they said, it'll never run, it'll never run, it'll never run, it'll never run, it'll never run. They finally got the thing running. And they said, it'll never stop, it'll never stop, it'll never stop, it'll never stop. And that's about like Evelyn, she doesn't want to speak in public, but if you get her going, oh boy, you know, maybe she'd never stop. I'd love doing that. I hope all this helps. You know, I don't guess one thing really helps. Um, I, I, I guess I could summarize saying this. God's more interested in preparing the messenger, the messenger. His message is already prepared. Mm-hmm. Brother Hagin said to me, he said, you're just delivering God's message. Somebody said, well, I have such a hard time getting a sermon. <laughs> well, well, where are you going to get it? The Bible's full of them. And put the emphasis where God puts the emphasis. You'll spend the rest of your life just saying what God wants people to know. That's preaching and preaching it in the power of God's Holy Spirit, loving it, passionately giving it. You folks are so kind and so courageous (laughs) uh, and so desperate that you are listening and coming on for this. But I really appreciate it. I'm very grateful. And... uh, I, I, I get up looking forward to this. I, I'm thinking all the time about what I'm going to say next time we meet. I am going to talk about the coming revival. And you say, well, I've heard enough about that. Well, no. It's going to begin somewhere. It's going to begin somewhere. And I don't mean geographically. I mean it's going to begin in one of your ministries. It may begin in your children's Sunday school department. It may begin in your bus ministry. It might begin in your preaching. It might begin in your singing. They tell me that the the, the great revival in Wales that reached a shaking of the whole world began with a 16-year-old girl singing, Here is Love. It might begin there. Wherever God chooses is fine with me. I'm going to say amen, Lord. I'm just praying that the revival will come. How about you? Love you guys. I really need your prayers. I'm trying to press on, not just endure to the end. Some of, some of it's that. But just to love the Lord and serve the Lord because I love Him. And uh, thank you for letting me be myself. It gets pretty boring sometimes, but... At least I don't have to put on an act. I couldn't stand that. I just couldn't stand it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have we got a microphone, one of these boys? James, can you take the microphone and lead in prayer? Close it out here. Yeah, okay, we have to turn it on. Got a great group in here helping me. A lot of them are on vacation, you know. We're going to fire them, I guess, while they've been gone. While they're gone. <laughs> just kidding. Some of you got to develop a sense of humor. You're going to lose your mind if you don't. If you want a good laugh, go, go somewhere and look at yourself. All right? It's worse than you thought. <laughs> Let's pray together, okay? Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for what we've heard today, and we pray for each and one of the pastors that has joined us. Bless them. We pray for others who will watch in coming days, and may we please Thee, may our preaching be honoring to Jesus Christ. We're thankful for Pastor Sexton. Bless him and Mrs. Sexton. Help us all to desire to bring honor and glory to Thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. See you later. Send me an email. Amen. God bless.